All right, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, my challenge is to talk to you about computer models of urban development and keep you awake for the next few minutes, so hopefully we can do that. Um, I'm going to explain first a little bit uh, why uh, we use models like Urban Sim and the travel models that are used by MTC. Um, and uh, the, the obvious reason here is that there are major decisions to make that involve quite substantial investments. And we can't just take uh, natural experiments and make investments without uh, understanding something ahead of time uh, about what the consequences of those investments might be. So we have to conduct research and uh, use models such as this uh, in advance to try to make informed estimates of what the out outcomes might be. Uh, but to put this in context a bit, um, this is uh, my own assessment of why modeling is quite difficult uh, to use in an applied context. Uh, these are some of the things that I learned over the uh, now almost two decades of, of doing uh, modeling and supporting decision making in local governments and regional planning efforts. Uh, I think these models uh, need to be very transparent, they need to be efficient, they need to be behaviorally valid and uh, uh, be well representative of the data that we can actually observe, and they need to be usable by uh, planners and, and other stakeholders in the process. Um, I would also say that models are only a small player in this process. Uh, they need to be situated in a political and a planning process that is deliberative and thoughtful and that is informed by goal setting and objectives and strategies such as Plan Bay Area. Uh, and then there needs to be an experimental phase in which policies can be put together in different combinations. They can be analyzed with models and various forms of evaluation and deliberation can occur in a way that can uh, be iteratively refined uh, with public involvement. Urban Sim is a land use model that is uh, really intended to uh, demonstrate uh, the impacts of transportation uh, and land use policies uh, and environmental policies on urban development outcomes over uh, periods of time uh, ranging up to three decades, which is the typical planning horizon for regional transportation plans. Uh, it has had uh, almost $20 million of federal investment in funding uh, from National Science Foundation principally, but also from the Environmental Protection Agency, Federal Highway Administration, and a lot of work with local and state governments. Um, it is becoming the most widely used such tool for uh, analyzing urban development uh, by metropolitan planning organizations throughout the United States, and is also being used in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and in the last couple of years, we have developed uh, Synthicity as a private startup uh, to provide commercial professional support for this. So to differentiate uh, urban sim and the use of models like this from, say, sketch planning tools, which some of you might have heard of, uh, the idea here is that we're trying to help local governments and uh, citizens understand how do we actually realize the visions that local communities have. Uh, what kinds of tools are available? How do those tools shape uh, different outcomes? Uh, how do zoning policies, comprehensive plans, urban growth boundaries, and various other policies, uh, such as transport investments, shape various outcomes? Uh, these are some of the places that Urban Sim is being used. Uh, on the left are the uh, metropolitan areas in the United States that are using it for regional transportation plans and other planning efforts. And it's being used in a variety of places around the world for various research and planning uh, efforts. We use a lot of data. Uh, this is a very data-driven uh, and empirically grounded, evidence-based uh, modeling approach. We take information about uh, the city and the region uh, down to the parcel and building level of detail. We obtain information on every business establishment, census data, zoning, general plans, and uh, planning boundaries to uh, develop the models that, uh, that we use. The level of detail is also very high. Not only do, do we cover, uh, for example, in the Bay Area, the nine counties uh, as a whole, but we go down to the level of detail of individual parcels, businesses, and uh, buildings. At a high level, you can think of this as a model of the real estate market. Uh, what we're trying to do is understand and have a uh, quantifiable way to predict the impacts of governments changing land use regulations and changing infrastructure and how that influences where and how development happens. So we're trying to understand how the real estate market works in some detail, 
how businesses and households respond to opportunities and constraints and prices in the real estate market and um, uh, use that to inform decision making. This is a little bit more detailed representation of how the modeling system is set up, uh, representing households, making individual choices about when to move, where to move, uh, with different housing opportunities, with uh, different neighborhoods showing different housing prices, uh, different levels of accessibility that influence their location choices. And a similar pattern of choices for businesses making location choices, where to expand, where to start new businesses, and uh, where to locate. Uh, and then centrally to this, we're looking at real estate developers uh, that make decisions about where to develop greenfield development and redevelopment and infill. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes on uh, explaining uh, essentially how we approach the real estate development process uh, by first understanding that there are a wide variety of different types of development, which we can broadly classify into fee-based development and speculative development, or more uh, standard uh, speculative development. Uh, we analyze both of those. Uh, fee development includes major plan development projects, uh, Candlestick Park, for example, or uh, Treasure Island, major plan developments uh, that need to be taken into consideration. And then speculative development, which is uh, private developers making decisions in the marketplace. We classify real estate into a wide variety of different types, uh, trying to represent uh, the mixture of real estate that is relevant in any particular regional context. Um, and then we analyze the various processes by which real estate developers make choices. Uh, how they identify land that's suitable for development, looking at underutilized property, property that's listed, or following market conditions where there's absorption and rents that suggest that there are opportunities. They then evaluate sites and the feasibility of development on different sites. Uh, in some cases, having to combine parcels for consolidating enough land to build a suitable development. They look at uh, market competition uh, for retail, for example, looking at the market penetration of different retail facilities, uh, and the uh, same for other types of real estate. They then have to analyze the cost of development, not only the materials, the labor, and so forth, but also the cost of acquiring sites. Uh, more expensive uh, locations in the region uh, obviously change the nature of what kind of development is feasible in those locations. Similarly, uh, zoning and other land use regulations influence what can be feasibly built, not only in terms of the zoning buildable envelope, but in terms of the financial feasibility of different kinds of development. So they look at uh, developing financial models called pro forma models that include a wide variety of different costs and a wide variety of revenue estimates to come up with essentially how profitable uh, or whether even a project would be feasible. Uh, and in a graphical form, this is roughly what is, uh, is being done by the model. We're looking at uh, every type of allowed development on every parcel in the region, looking at what the zoning says can or cannot be done, uh, finding out at different densities whether or not uh, any of the uh, types of development would be at all profitable, and if there are multiple uses that would be profitable, which one is mo most profitable? We also then compare it to minimum rates of return that are required by investors uh, in order to finance development in the first place. So we look at various inputs besides the data I've already mentioned, uh, policy inputs that go into scenarios. Um, so for a project like Plan Bay Area, there's a combination of transport policies. It may be transit investments, roadway investments, pricing, uh, trans, uh, travel demand management policies, on the one hand, and on the land use side, city comprehensive plans, zoning, building codes, parking requirements, uh, transit-oriented developments, subsidies, impact fees, urban growth boundaries, and protection of environmentally sensitive land. So all the portfolio of tools that local governments actually use to guide and shape development. Uh, the model is then predicting where and when land is developed, uh, the pattern of spatial demographics, what kinds of households uh, are able to and do prefer different locations given the housing market conditions, uh, changes in the spatial economy where businesses are growing, where they're shrinking, where they're clustering, and transportation and environmental outcomes uh, through combination with the travel model, uh, such as is shown here. So the combination of these models allows uh, 
really uh, an extensive evaluation of different kinds of policies in combination. Zoning, growth boundaries, fees and subsidies for in the portfolio of land use policies, road networks, transit networks, road pricing, and parking policies form the transportation parts of the puzzle. So that's a quick sketch of the uh, analytical components of the model. Uh, I thought it would be useful to show just a little bit about also how we visualize model results. Because the models are producing such massive amounts of detailed data, it's very hard to visualize or understand that data without some form of visualization. So we've created a platform called Urban Canvas to make the results more legible uh, to the public, to stakeholders of all kinds. So this is just an example of um, some of the work that we're doing. If I can get the video to show, maybe not. It was working for me earlier, but it's not now. Um, so um, we have developed a three-dimensional visualization platform that enables, um, actually it is showing there, it's not on my screen for some reason. So what you're seeing here is the Urban Canvas platform, uh, which enables uh, experimental analysis, uh, inputting of different scenarios, uh, changing zoning patterns, changing development types, exploring transit-oriented development projects, for example, and then analyzing them in a real estate market and analysis platform like UrbanSim to evaluate what is feasible, what kinds of development would actually be plausible, and then to also enable the public to visualize what these development patterns might look like. So this gives you a reasonably good sense of what the visualization uh, platform does. Um, and I'm going to wind down my comments by transitioning to how we're moving from the regional scale to working with local cities. Uh, we're working with the San Francisco uh, Planning Department at this point through San Francisco Entrepreneurs and Residence Program uh, to look at their housing element uh, and how they're dealing with build-out analysis and with a development typology that lets them examine what kinds of development would be plausible or feasible in different parts of the city. Uh, we're developing a web-based platform that would allow stakeholders, possibly community residents even, to interactively design and evaluate development proposals. So um, we're developing a uh, proposal browser that allows people to look at what proposals have already been generated on different sites, uh, possibly create or modify proposals and store them for other people to evaluate and examine. And then a proposal editor that enables people to create a three-dimensional model very interactively and it also provides a dashboard of indicators about those projects, how financially feasible they are, what kinds of impacts they might have on local traffic conditions, and other kinds of outcomes. So with that, um, I will close my comments and uh, open it up for any, any follow-up. Seeing none, I will go to the public who have submitted speaker cards on this item, and that is, uh, first one is Mimi Steele. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to request that if you are going to do a traveling road show on this uh, modeling, that you not only include the planning people and the public officials, but you also include the citizens. I would be very interested in hearing what kind of reaction that they have to your modeling. Um, having said that, I guess what concerns me the most is that you have 7.5 million people in the Bay Area suppo supposedly projected to going up to 9 million people in the Bay Area. How do you account for individual decisions? I don't see anything in this modeling that deals with the free market. I don't see anything in this modeling that really takes account of private property rights. I heard uh, Mr. Luce indicate that they're going to give 10% of housing if you live close. Where the heck are you getting that money from? And how the heck do you determine who is worthy of getting those kinds of subsidies? I think that's very unfair to the taxpayers in the Bay Area. You talk about data. What about people? You know, we're not a bunch of physics particles that you can model. We have individual feelings, we have individual reasons for making our decisions, and I don't see any of that reflected in your models. Finally, having been in the computer industry for a long time, I can say we always use the term GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Steele. I'm sure that if you have uh, further questions you'd like to ask uh, Mr. Luce about their program in Napa, he would be happy to fill you in on that. In fact, I suspect it's on their website uh, for the uh, County of Napa. Uh, the next speaker is Fred Volkton. <clears throat> Just a couple things. Um, you went back to computer modeling again. I keep hearing this word computer modeling. I'm not a computer person, so I'm not going to berate it. But I do know I've done a lot of research on referred to as global warming based on computer modeling. We now know, if you've ever taken a weather class, that it's, wrong, that it's actually wrong. And, uh, uh, and on a daily basis, we're finding out more and more about how wrong it is. Um, and now you want to use computer modeling for the people? I agree with Mimi. Okay, thank you for your comments. And this was an item for information and discussion, so there is no decision on this item. But um, I'm sure we will make sure that everyone knows about any potential uh, future workshops on this. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate your coming. Fasc fascinating. Um, item.